This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Today we're going to hear the story of one of the most famous women in science, Jane Goodall. But we pick things up with Louis Leakey, the paleoanthropologist, recorded here in 1970. Okay, rolling. Leaky special, roll one, one take one. Dr. Leakey, could you explain to us the importance of the study of primate behavior to contemporary man? Uh, yes, it's very easy, really, and especially the higher primates. You see, today there are living three of the higher primates, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutan, and they are the, our closest living cousins, and consequently, as our nearest cousins, they must be in a position to throw some light on my problem. I'm concerned with the study of early man and proto-man. And it was because of that that I looked around to find somebody, first of all, studying the chimpanzees. And so I invited Jane, who's here with me today, to study the chimpanzees in depth down in a place in Tanzania and warned her very carefully indeed that it was going to be a very long job. A very long job. July 14, 2015 marks the 55th anniversary of the day that Jane Goodall first arrived at the Gombe Stream Game Reserve in Tanzania to start her life's work. Today, Jane Goodall is a hero in science classrooms everywhere. The woman who showed us the amazing world of chimpanzees and changed the way we define ourselves as humans. In our episode today, we're going back in time to the late 1950s, when we knew practically nothing about the lives of wild chimps. We didn't even know how closely related we are to them. In 1957, Jane Goodall was 23 years old. A close friend had invited her to Kenya. She'd spent the previous summer working long hours as a waitress to fund the trip. Goodall had always dreamed of going to Africa. In 2004, she told her story to author and leaky family biographer Virginia Morell as part of an oral history project. This interview has never been heard before. This is an interview with Dr. Jane Goodall for the Leakey Oral History Project for the Leakey Foundation and the UC Berkeley Bancroft Library. What I've done with everyone is to start sort of at the beginning, which is mm -hmm. how they first heard about the Leakeys, and in your case, how you came to meet uh, Dr. Lewis Leakey. Well, I first heard about Lewis when I had a job in Nairobi, and I was 23 years old, and somebody said, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis Leakey. So I called the Natural History Museum, the Corindon Museum, and a voice answered and said, hello, and I said, I would like to meet Dr. Leakey, and he said, I'm Leakey, what do you want? <laughs> so that led to an appointment, and I distinctly remember him taking me around and asking me many, many, many questions. And because I'd been reading a lot and going to the Natural History Museum in London, I and could was, answer many of those questions. He was asking you questions uh, about the animals. Did I know what this was? And you know, and then he took me around and, and I knew things like ichthyology and I think that impressed him. So I ended up being offered a job because his assistant was his secretary really. Well, he was being very genial. He was being very charming, and and um, so I thought he was wonderful. I was always on the lookout for ways of going and being out in the field and looking at animals. So when when he offered me the job, I remember saying, right, that first meeting. But if I'm going to take a a job, a regular job. It's really important for me to go out and see a bit of Africa first because I had to, you know, I had to go outside Nairobi. He said, well, I do have an expedition in the summer for three months, um, but that will depend if whether my wife likes you. His wife was renowned paleoanthropologist Mary Leakey. And the expedition Louis Leakey was talking about was to Olduvai Gorge, one of the richest and most famous fossil sites in the world. I remember meeting Mary Leakey, and she wanted me to ride her pony back from a pony club hunt. And fortunately, I had this feeling, and I, the, the pony walked backwards. They didn't tell me the pony always walked backwards with a stranger on, on his back. Sherry, he was called. And something made me get off. 
and removed the saddle and there were these two huge saddle sores. So of course I could do no wrong. That was oh. it. I, 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 you know, I made it in Mary Leakey's eyes. The sensitivity to animals. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, and her beloved pony. So I, w I went back to have lunch at the house and got on fine with everybody. I you know there were little animals running around. There was a, I don't know, a diker or a dick dick or something like that, and yes. the odd hyrax. And so for me, it was just magic, <laughs> complete magic. So Jane Goodall joined the Leakey's expedition to Olduvai. Another assistant from the Corindon Museum came along too. Her name was Gillian Trace. It was a 300-mile journey from Nairobi to Olduvai. Lewis and Mary Leakey had worked at the site for decades, searching for early hominin fossils. Leakey had what was at that time a blasphemous idea, that humans came from Africa, and he needed the bones to prove it. It was a very overloaded car, and there was also a big truck, which had all the, you know, had the, the Kenyans and the equipment, such as it was. Julian and I had to take turns to be squashed in the back with the two Dalmatians. Yeah, every time we saw something interesting, we stopped and looked at it. Once we got sort of, you know, off the beaten track, which most of it was at that time. As they made their way across the Serengeti plains of Tanzania towards Olduvai Gorge, Jane Goodall saw the Africa she had imagined as a small girl back in England. I'd been in some forest and seen leopard tracks, and that was oh. exciting. Oh, yeah. There was no track in those days. There was nothing, nothing, not a mark, not a mark of a tire. And all we saw for three months was the odd Maasai. That's it. Nothing. No. It was magic. Yeah. Yeah, setting up tents at night. Olduvai Gorge is a steep-sided ravine in the Rift Valley of eastern Africa, not quite big enough to be called a canyon. Erosion has carved its way through, exposing layers of rock dating back to two million years ago. It's very dry and very hot. There aren't many trees, but there are lots of fossils. During the day, Jane worked on the dig. They woke at dawn and worked until it got too hot. They'd take a break and start up again when it cooled down. We, we were given our little patch, and we were given very different tools to what they use today. We had a hunting knife that we took off the heavy stuff. The, the Kenyans did worked with picks to remove the scree if it was a new um, bed. Scree is what they call the chunks of broken rock covering a slope. It had to be cleared by hand to get to the interesting stuff. And the last bit, when you're getting down to the bone layer, Mary didn't like them to do it because she thought, you know, if they broke a bone, it's better she did it than the, than the Kenyans did. So she would wield a pick, and she was very happy because I could wield a pick too. And Gillian wasn't so strong, so I was the favored one. And um, anyway, we, if we found a bone, we used a smaller knife or a dental pick and got them out and marked the ones we dug out with a date and, and the place we found them. And then we went back and did some more digging. And Bottom Biter was, and the dog with Toots were there to warn everybody of lions. That's, Mary had to have her dogs. And I didn't really care about the fossils that much. I cared about the animals. So I was really lucky. I went at exactly the right time. We all know Jane Goodall's destiny wasn't to dig for fossils. But at Olduvai Gorge, she got her first experiences with the wild animals of Africa. There were gazelles and zebras, and the miniature antelopes called dictics. The Leakeys let Jane and Jillian go for walks, away from the dig site, as long as they brought Mary Leakey's dogs with them. Well, Jillian and I were just having our walk, and, and um, I remember a tiny mouse ran across the trail, and the two dogs chased it under one of these low acacias. And you know how you feel something behind you. And I looked around, there was this young lion, about two years old. And he was just looking at us, lashing his tail, I suppose, the distance of this room. And, and then Julian and I had an argument because she wanted to dive into the thick stuff. And I said, well, that's silly because he'll know exactly where we are and we won't know where he is. So we have to walk up, you know, in the open onto the rim, out of the gorge, onto the rim which is what we did, and she didn't dare look back. 
So I had to keep looking back and, and saying, well, he isn't any closer. <laughs> he followed us. And then finally we stopped, he stopped following. We made it to the top. And Julian had toots. Toots was the champion of all breeds of Kenya. I remember this so well. And Julian let Toots go. Toots, who had no idea about the lion, because the wind was right, went diving back for the mouse. <gasps> we called and called, and I can remember starting back down, because I thought, well, it's the end of everything if a lion eats Toots. Anyway, we got Toots back. Louis Leakey and Jane Goodall spent a lot of time together at Old Dubai. We talked about animals all the time, and he knew I was really interested. And he knew I cared, and he realized that I was tough. He realized that I didn't care about, you know, parties and clothes and things like that. I think it was after we met the lion, at least after, after we met a young lion, it was then I remember Louis talking about a group of chimps on a remote lake shore and how he hoped one day to find somebody to study them. Well, I knew that couldn't be me because I didn't have a degree or anything. But he kept talking about this group and in the end I remember saying, Lewis, I wish you, I wish you wouldn't keep talking about this because that's just the kind of thing I want to do. And he said, well, why do you think I'm talking about it? I mean, I really couldn't believe it, but that's how it went. Oh, I was amazed. I mean, I was thrilled. Would I be prepared? Yes. Yeah. It was still a year before we could get there. And he had to be found, and the permission had to be sought. This would be the first study of its kind, the first to study chimps in the wild. And Louis Leakey thought Jane Goodall, with no degree or anything, was the right person for the job. Well, he always said women made better observers, that they were more patient and um, more sensitive, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily correct, but I think that they are female characteristics. Yeah. And females tend to be, tend to be quieter and um, less, less wanting to dominate mm -hmm. and be the better of, you know. So I think, I think he sensed all those, mm -hmm. all those characteristics. Did you have any no. thoughts or you just... No, I, yeah. I was just, you know, longing to get there. I didn't know how I'd do it, and there was nobody to tell me. I remember just feeling um, almost like there's something sure to go wrong. It can't really be happening, you know. Yeah. Not wanting to get too excited in case it went wrong again. So just quietly getting on and getting everything ready and not thinking too much. <laughs> what Jane Goodall was trying to do was unheard of in the late 1950s. Young women did not go off into remote jungles alone to study wild animals. At the time, Tanzania was a United Nations trust territory under British control. The colonial officers gave their approval for her trip to the Gombe Stream Reserve only after this grown woman agreed to take a parent with her. It was the administration in Kigoma okay. who was so horrified at the thought of a young woman alone. So um, in the end they said, well, as long as she has a companion, so it was my amazing mother who came and volunteered for the first four out of those six months. And we collected up all the stuff ready for that expedition. Lewis helped us, Lewis told us what to get, and as far as I remember, Lewis must have actually bought all the stuff because we didn't have a car or anything. And then he persuaded one of the a museum, the um, botanist, mm -hmm. drove us. Didn't think he'd ever see us again, thought it was crazy. The botanist? <laughs> yes, did. everyone. They all thought Lewis was amoral. They all thought that sending off two, two lone, unarmed women into the bush was the most ridiculous, stupid thing. Goodall arrived in Kigoma, on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, with her mother Van, ready to begin her dream job. She and her mother, along with their cook Dominic and their game warden escort, loaded up the boat and set off across the lake. Yeah, Lewis had got a little boat. It was a simple little aluminium boat. Very good one, actually. And finally got permission to go. And the warden, 
who was there to see us established, he was actually quite irritable about everything. He thought it was stupid. He didn't think I, that we'd stay more than two weeks. That's what he told everyone. No, he thought it was mad. But, you know, we got on fine with him once we'd met him. He melted and, and um, so he put us and our boat on the little government launch, Kibisi, which is still there, and took us along and, and uh, landed us where his two game scouts were and helped us put up the tent. You camp right on the shores of the lake? Just, just in? Just a tiny bit in, yeah. yeah. And the game ranger organized meetings telling everybody locally who we were and what we were doing and they all thought we'd be spies that that the government wanted to get more more land into the park so we had to be watched to start with because <laughs> we was you know they thought that if I saw one chimp I'd write down four in other words more chimps needed more land that's what I they see. were convinced so well, it didn't happened. last long. Yeah. How long did it take before you convinced them otherwise? A month. A month. A eh? few weeks. <laughs> what was What was your reaction when you saw where you were going to be? Well, my reaction was, how am I going to find the chimps? Because I looked into those valleys, and it, it somehow seemed much bigger then, because, of course, the forest was all the way to Kigoma, so it seemed mm -hmm. a, a much bigger wilderness area. And it was totally unknown. And I knew that in that place, that somewhere there were chimps. But, you know, how would I find them? It just seemed like a needle in a haystack. And um, then to start with, I had to have these two people always with me. And so we'd go clumping up a valley, and the chimps came to a tree, but they were too far away to see them, and it was all quite, you know, it was exciting, but at the same time, I knew that I needed to see something exciting to get more money. So it was, um, it was very worrying too. The first months were tough. The land was very rugged. Dense forests covered the steep hills. The chimps ran away every time she got close. When the months long rainy season started, everything was sopping wet, morning till night. It felt like she was never dry. She trekked through the forest every day trying to find the chimps. She and her mother both got sick with fevers. She worried the funding would run out and she'd fail to learn anything about chimpanzees. Yeah, it was quite funny because I would write and say, you know, I can't do it because I just, you know, he'd put all that money and trust in me and I was getting more and more worried. And every time I wrote back and said, I can't do it, um, he'd write back and his, his writing got bigger and bigger saying, I know you can. And of course, the more he said, I know you can, the more pressure I felt. Because I didn't know what else to do than what I was doing. Finally, after four months, Goodall had a breakthrough. It all started with one chimp. Well, the breakthrough was David Greybeard. First of all, losing his fear. And secondly, demonstrating tool losing. And how did he lose his fear of you? I don't know. He just was always, he often, started feeding over this, where the um, little African camp was, where Dominic was and, and um, the game scout. And uh, David would be seen feeding there. And the women would come and tell, tell their husbands, because they were, you know, getting firewood. And they were always seeing this one chimp with his gray beard. It was David. <laughs> and so he became tolerant of you. Yeah, so why he lost his fear before the others, you know, who knows? Yeah. It's just that they're all different. And and then he, because of his lack of fear, then uh, the other chimps saw that and they responded yeah. to Yeah, yeah, so he helped me to habituate, really, but he really did. So anyway, mum left after four months and must have been early November, I saw the two losing. Just after mum had gone back, so I had nobody to share the excitement with. So the two losing, as I had not been to university, I, I, I don't know that I even, well, I guess I knew it was fascinating. I don't think I realized how fascinating it was. Mm -hmm. But I do remember thinking, well, I, I know I've seen David. And I, I know he 
picked grasses and and put them in the nest, but I couldn't really see properly, so I didn't dare believe it. In the termite it. nest? Yeah, okay. you know, I could only see his back view. What she saw was David Greybeard the chimp, hunched over and poking a long stalk of grass into a termite mound, pulling it out and eating the termites that got stuck to the grass. Um, so I didn't dare tell Lewis until I'd seen it twice more. I wanted to be sure. I wanted to know it wasn't just an aberrant thing. Or... So as it was the termite season by then, I saw it twice more and then wrote this telegram, or was telegram, and his reply was, now we must redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. And he must have been just pleased as he could be, yeah. I should think. Did yeah, he, he used to go around talking about me. I heard that from lots of other people. Do you remember what, the, what they said he was no, telling No, that he them? was just um, very proud of, of me and what I'd done. And you see, I told you so, and I wasn't so <laughs> stupid after all. Especially after people saying that it yes, wasn't something. Yes, it was amoral. It was, yeah. Within the first year of her study at Gombe, she discovered things that forever changed the way we define humans. She learned that not only did chimpanzees use tools, they made them too, stripping leaves off the grass to make the stalks work better. She learned that they hunted and ate meat and shared it with each other. Before her study, people thought they were peaceful vegetarians. She learned about every detail of their lives, their relationships, their childhoods. She came to know them as individuals. She gave them names. It's been 55 years since Jane Goodall first set foot in the Gombe Forest, and the study of the Gombe chimps is still going strong. It's the oldest ongoing continuous study of any animal in the wild. It's grown from a single scientist in a tent with her mother to a research center with teams of scientists, students, and trackers who work at Gombe on new studies of chimpanzee behavior. Gombe is now a national park with rangers to protect chimps from poachers. Jane Goodall herself now travels the world, working to save chimpanzees from extinction. For all these years, Everything the Gombe chimps do has been observed and recorded, using a system Jane Goodall designed. And not just major events like births and deaths. Every social interaction, meal, grooming session, squabble, display, that's a lot of information. What do you do with all that information? Find out in an upcoming episode of Origin Stories. Thanks so much to the amazing Jane Goodall for sharing her story. You can learn more about her and her work on her website, janegoodall.org. And thanks to ROHO, the Regional Oral History Office of the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley, for partnering with the Leakey Foundation for the Lewis Leakey Centennial Oral History Project, which Jane Goodall's interview was part of. We'll have links on our website, originstoriespodcast.org, where you can find out more. This episode of Origin Stories was produced by me, Meredith Johnson, and edited by Audrey Quinn. We had help from Skylar Swenson. This episode was scored by Henry Nagel with original music and music by the Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. This show is a project of the Leakey Foundation. The Leakey Foundation was named for Louis Leakey. Since 1968, we've been supporting exciting scientific research, including studies of primates in the wild. The Leakey Foundation is a longtime supporter of Jane Goodall and other scientists who help us to understand primate behavior. The Leakey Foundation provides funding for long-term studies at Gombe and around the world. You can help support this important work and learn more at leakeyfoundation.org. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org. Our show is made possible with support from Wells Fargo Bank. And thanks to our sponsor, Adept Word Management, Intelligent Transcripts. You can find them at adeptwordmanagement.com. That's A-D-E-P-T wordmanagement.com. Thanks so much for listening. If you like our show, please tell your friends and give us a review on iTunes. It really helps spread the word and we appreciate it a lot.